Once upon a time lived a romantic man and a romantic woman. The first time he saw her, she had her hair pulled back in a loose bun so that the wind enhanced her simultaneously careful and careless work of tufted art. As he stared, he was struck by the smell of freshly baked bread, French, a baguette carried in an antique handlebar basket. She was riding a vintage bicycle, perfectly aged so the rust aesthetically enhanced the carefully crafted machine. And she was riding this bicycle in a skirt. The first time she saw him, he was driving a vintage convertible, a car clearly owned by someone who values classic beauty over flash and flair. He was lighting a pipe, which he lit with a match, not a lighter. Slightly dizzied by the aroma of artisan hand-mixed Moroccan tobacco, she saw the man check the time on his pocket watch. Whether her well-timed accident was caused by random fortune or cosmic intervention, they would never know or question. It was, obvious to them, a part of their fairy tale. And as the prince in the story, saving the damsel in distress, he knew he was made for this moment. As was she. Intoxicated by infatuation and the flawlessness of the moment, they imagined an immense depth and complexity in each other. She saw in him someone who likely loved books other people pretended to read, who probably sculpted emotive nudes which he would then shatter because they were dangerously captivating. And who, surely, in another life, was a bow-wielding vigilante able to strike an evil man down from a hundred yards. He saw in her someone who must be a poet, and who, surely, composed prolific photographs which would not be publicly appreciated until long after her death. And so, as they lost themselves in these romantic fantasies, he gently treated her wound with a homeopathic herb poultice, and she utilized her antique Polaroid camera to take a sublimely vignetted photograph of the moment. The moment they fell in love. Sadly, however, there was a terminal flaw within this auspicious encounter. For the lovers prided themselves so deeply in their own romanticism that both desperately wanted to prove how most innately and most eruditely romantic they were. But there is an inherent problem with superlatives. There can be only one. Those are beautiful. Do you ride horseback? Yes, I do, she lied. I love horses. Such classical creatures. I'd imagined you did. There's nothing I love more. Save for ballet, taken aback a bit. You danced to Paris Opera Ballet for three years. The man suddenly realized that she might be more romantic than he and looking for an opportunity to regain lost ground, I use an antique straight razor. There's nothing better really, but you need a skilled hand to use one. I'd imagine it requires a similar technique to that of ancient calligraphy. I had little time for such skills because of my dedication to painting and archery.
and with these tit-for-tat exchanges, an unhealthy obsession had begun to grow within them, to slowly and, of course, lovingly defeat one another. Neither would submit. The man determined to complete his gentlemanly repertoire. And the woman set out to hone her noble skills. And so, exhausted and driven to the mental brink by their mutually exclusive goals, they approached an impasse where one of them must break. His honor had been challenged, and while he did not know a great deal about honor, he knew it sounded romantic. A duel, pistols, at sunrise, full of her own scorned fury, the woman would not retreat, but she also did not want to die. And knowing, or rather believing, the man to be a crack shot, she devised a plan to ensure she would attain all the things she wanted. She would ruin the aim of both guns, thereby guaranteeing her survival, regardless of the gun he chose. But the perfection of her plan was this. She had no intention of firing her own weapon, but instead would dramatically cast it aside. Because she knew, if it appeared that she, so filled with romantic love, was unable to fire upon her lover, even as he tried to strike her down, then she would finally beat him. But, as was always the case with these two ill-fated lovers, their plans did not coincide, and he had plans of his own. He knew that his aim was anything but accurate, 
and he knew that actually shooting her was not something he would ever, ever be able to do. So he came ready to be shot. If it appeared that she, in violent anger, had mortally wounded him, a wound he would miraculously survive, and if she believed that he, uh, though a crack shot, had been spurred by love to intentionally miss her, then there would be no question that he, and he alone, was the most romantic. What neither of them knew, however, was that his inaccuracy was an issue of simple grade school geometry. While he knew he was right-handed, he didn't realize he was a left-eye dominant, which for one made monocle use difficult, and similarly made his line of aim always completely off. One common way to compensate for this angular problem would be to hold the weapon in the left hand. The other would be to bend the barrel. As she lay there, she tried to ascertain where her carefully laid plan had gone awry, and why it was that she was now dying by pistol shot in the arms of her scorned lover, while wearing a classically gorgeous white dress, on a molted deathbed of oak leaves, in a picturesque wooded glen, something occurred to her. This was, unquestionably, irrefutably, and irrevocably, the most romantic thing that could ever happen. Simultaneously, as he sat there, holding his dead lover, he tried to ascertain where his carefully laid plan had gone awry, why it was that he was now weeping over her tragically splayed body and proclaiming to the heavens, I cannot live without her while watching the dark blood exquisitely stain her gorgeous white dress on a molted deathbed of oak leaves, in a picturesque wooded glen, something occurred to him. Now this was unquestionably, irrefutably, and irrevocably the most romantic thing that could ever, ever happen. And so, the romantic man and the romantic woman died happily ever after. Thank you.